Okay, so I'm a professor of philosophy. I teach at St. Joseph's University in Long Island, New York. Um, I'm also a doctoral student at the New School for Social Research. Um, I've been publishing some things recently um, on, on laws of form, and um, I'll be talking about that. So, I mean, we could, we could skip on to what we're getting to. This in particular is a part two of the stuff that I that I presented last time here, um, but really didn't develop until the, the thing I wrote, which is coming out um, soon. So let's, let's, let's get on with it. So my talk is entitled uh, Universal Ontology and the First Distinction, Spencer Brown, Husserl, and Conrad Martius. In a chapter of Laws of Form, a 50th anniversary, the forthcoming work related to this conference called uh, first Philosophy and the First Distinction, Ontology and Phenomenology of Laws of Form, I contributed some ways to generally tying the paradigm of Spencer Brown from its first principle, the first distinction, to first philosophy, as broadly understood from ancient Greek philosophy to contemporary phenomenology and cybernetic philosophy. In this next development, I aim to connect this work on first philosophy to a work of ultimate philosophy, this will take the form of articulating a new universal ontology of reality and ultimate reality based on the formal ontological paradigm of laws of form. Universal ontology is the ultimate intention of first philosophy. It brings in its wake the speculative metaphysical project of grounding all things in a common foundation, in common terms, somewhat paradoxically including the kinds of things that are not things at all. Such universality stands on a hypothesis of true reality that entails a true metaphysical system and its connection to a hypostatic series of realities. Anti-penultimate reality, penultimate reality, and ultimate reality, finally, from which it originates. Such a project should be understood in conventional as well as novel terms, as it seeks to approximate the cognition of a vision, method, and doctrine appropriate to the ultimate truth of being. It should present a theory of being, including along with all beings, beings that are beyond being. The theory itself should be a theory of forms that is also a theory of possible theory forms. The universal ontologies of the phenomenologists Edmund Husserl and Hedwig Conrad Martius are here synthesized with George Spencer Brown's paradigm to contribute such a system. Introduction. Laws of form gives expression to a radical universality, and this universality is what I will refer to as Spencer Brown's paradigm. Distinction, or difference, is ubiquitous and universal. But what is distinction? Clearly, many things are distinct as much as many things are the same. George Spencer Brown's idea of the first distinction, and the idea of indication, or reference, connected with it, and of the form of distinction, give us an economy of principles. Or more precisely, it is an economy of the form that the first principle takes that gives us the inferential engine of its motivation, sustenance, and goal, the calculus of indications. The constellation of first ideas can be understood in formal ontological language as the calculus of indications, but also the ideas of indication and distinction and the calculus of indications depends on this, on, on this, this, uh, this constellation. What I want to contribute to this formal position is the universal ontological expression of Spencer Brown's paradigm as a kind of system appearing in our crystal ball, which we will soon come to recognize as the infinite sphere. I actually didn't get there, um, but we could talk about that at dinner. Um, the paper I really, I focus on Husserl and Conrad Martius, um, but maybe you'll be led there spontaneously, as is my hope. Okay, uh, wherever... <coughs> Whatever can be thought can be distinguished, given the formal transcendental nature of cognition, but also hypothesize, uh, but one also hypothesizes that objectivity can be distinguished independently of cognitive activity. That is to say that we are free to literally draw any, to draw a distinction in the materiality of sand or paper or any background against which a form appears to stand in relief, and we are free to assume that this activity of distinguishing is a kind of analogy for the constitution of objective reality. But beneath all activity of distinguishing, there exists also the distinct possibility of a convergence upon the limit of such freedom, 
reaching beyond material reality and beyond mere analogy as well. Spencer Brown's idea of the first distinction reaches this radical limit through the following thought experiment. Like the phenomenological epoche, this experiment reduces the multiplicity of distinctions that make up the manifold of the world to the one omnipresent distinction, the first distinction, the essence of all form. The transcendental distinction stands in, radically isolate, in radical isolation from any other possible distinction, but it is necessarily accompanied by an even deeper reality beyond it. This state, on the far side, beyond even the first distinction, is what Spencer Brown calls the unmarked state. As ideas that are hypothesized, or in Spencer, Brown words, uh, Spencer Brown's words, taken as given, page one, in the beginning of Laws of Form, these ideas have an ambiguous sense that soon becomes more definite and then develops, uh, continues to develop a sophisticated formal ontological sense as this sense functionally expands into an indicational space within which the forms of Spencer Brown's calculus develop. Laws of Form is a work of pure mathematics, but it is only purely a work of pure mathematics. It opens with a quo from the Tao Te Ching, it references Proclus and contains hints of metaphysical sense of its central element throughout the main text, and further reflections in the notes and appendices. In other works, such as Only Two Can Play This Game and A Lion's Teeth, and in interviews, conference, transcripts, and in personal communications as well, the metaphysical significance of Laws of Form is elaborated in sophisticated and well-defined ways that confirm an interpretation of Laws of Form that many have found to be actually just quite spontaneous and powerfully intuitive. I and others have appreciated this tremendous power of this work, and in an earlier investigation, I have also uh, sought this metaphysical sense, um, sought to bring it into close connection with what in philosophy is known as first philosophy, in the sense of this term's ancient Greek heritage and its Western metaphysical development. In first philosophy and the first distinction, I'll go back, that one, um, ontology and Phenomenology of Laws of Form, I described the adventure of the first distinction through the five levels of being as, quote, the first philosophy of the first distinction. That's what I called it. And showed how Spencer Brown's definition of distinction from page one of Laws of Form already places the first distinction at the center of the philosophical tradi tradition of the infinite sphere. There I also illustrate some of the ways Laws of Form can be connected to contemporary phenomenology. <coughs> In the final section, The Philosophical Destiny of Laws of Form, you can sort of read it on this slide down there, um, I hint at the relevance of Laws of Form for Husserl's more general, what he calls infinite task of scientific first philosophy, and more specific formal ontological task of a, quote, formal mathesis universalis. In that work, the intention was to lay out the first philosophy of the first distinction and the purpose, hinted at in the final section, was to build upwards on this foundation. The earlier work on first philosophy set the stage for this new work on universal ontology, a kind of ultimate philosophy, in that uh, universal ontology is the goal of the ontology of reality, and in that this philosophy of the infinite sphere, implied by the paradigm of laws of form, is also a universal ontology of ultimate reality. That's why it's ultimate, right? <laughs> that and a number of reasons, which if, if you're listening, you, you heard some, right? Um, section two is uh, universal ontology. Okay, what is universal ontology? Universal ontology is, in brief, a speculative metaphysical system. I am employing this designation for the following reasons. One, it is intended to indicate that the result of a spontaneous interpretation of George Spencer Brown's laws of form in metaphysical terms is a universal theory of being of a distinction within nothingness, a distinction between nothingness and nothingness. More technically, this could be called a universal me ontology or theory of non-being, but either way, both amount to the same thing, a way of seeing the transcendental unity, the logos of being and nothing and everything in between. The unmarked state is spontaneously understood to be more than a merely formal entity by Spencer Brown, as well as by any imaginative reader. The unmarked state cannot be said to be in the same way that the first distinction can, and neither of these, though radically distinct amongst themselves, can be said to exist 
in quite the same way that existent things exist, precisely by dimensional extension. Two, uh, drawing, uh, drawn from the nexus of terminology in contemporary continental philosophy, universal ontology has a sense first precisely specified in Edmund Husserl's works, but later more fully developed by Husserl's student, Hedvig Conrad Martius, quite independently of Husserl. In fact, um, I'll talk about, I think I t in here in this version, I talk about the split a little, but um, you'll recall um, that Claire mentioned that, um, that, I think it was a quote, where Husserl said that he like abandoned real ontology, um, maybe 1913, or maybe you tie it to specific things in math, I'm not sure, but um, the term itself, universal ontology, can be found still deeper in early modern philosophy and romantic philosophy of nature, but I will draw directly on the sense specified by Husserl and fleshed out by Conrad Martius. Connected to this sense of the term, the ancient tradition of the Mathesis Universalis, fundamental to Husserl's intentions, presents a parallel wellspring of the sense of this term. Conrad Martius' sense of universal ontology possesses the additional benefit of including in its extent in its extant doctrine her recursive philosophical cosmology and physical hyperspace theory, which I've written about elsewhere. This is fascinating stuff. <laughs> um, this is the natural and transcendental doctrine upon which, which I wish to build. Okay, and here's a third reason I'm using universal ontology. My own sense of universal ontology is intended to be a synthesis of Conrad Martius's metaphysical sense and Spencer Brown's formal ontological paradigm. My initial metaphysical interpretation of Spencer Brown's essential elements has remained constant over the years, except for the addition of one element, an outermost architectonic element known as the infinite sphere. This addition is also uh, no addition at all, since it is also implied in the being of the first distinction, and reciprocally, the center and periphery of the infinite sphere is implicitly is the first distinction. Um, this latter fact can be seen in Cusanus's naming, um, Nicholas of Cusa's naming at one point the the divine distinction, his central distinction, um, in his descriptions of the infinite sphere. The brief biographical story, the gist here, is that the placing of the idea of the first distinction at the center of a metaphysical paradigm in about 2001 represented a first Copernican revolution for me. And the placing of the infinite sphere around it in about 2015 represented a second. The pres this uh, presentation, the presentation of this uh, new universal ontology is the result of having undergone this journey. I could tell you more about that at dinner. Uh, section three, the earlier universal ontology, Hedvig Conrad Martius and Edmund Husserl. Hedvig Conrad Martius, 1888 to 1966, was a phenomenologist and accomplished natural scientist who developed important contributions to the philosophy of essence and existence in the form of a robust ontological phenomenology of nature, ontology of nature, and speculative cosmology, placing the natural world within real, actually extended, higher space-time realms, accounting for eternity, Aeonisha realm site, and infinity, Apairisha realm site. These were like higher dimensions, basically. Um, she was also the godmother of Edith Stein, Saint Benedicta of the Cross, and was herself a theosophical mystic of her own unique sort. Conrad Martius came to Göttingen in late 1910 to study with the founder of phenomenology, Edmund Husserl, whose years are 1859 to 1938. She attended two of Husserl's winter semester lecture series that have been made available in English as The Basic Problems of Phenomenology by James G. Hart and Logic and General Theory of Science by Claire Ortiz Hill. James Hart discusses the context of Conrad Martius' style of philosophizing called ontological phenomenology or real ontology in the preface to the basic problems of phenomenology, indicating passages where Husserl develops his own sense of the ontology of reality, which is where Conrad Martius picks up the method of, as Hart describes it, a noematic eidetics or ontology of the real and really real, end quote. In addition to these two lecture series, Conrad Martius also took courses under Husserl dedicated to Hume, Kant, ethics, and courses under Adolf Reinach, from whom she picked up the emphasis on realism. Around 1910, Husserl's publication Ideas, Volume 1, caused a rift in phenomenology, splitting the movement into two camps, the idealists, who followed Husserl in a kind of transcendental idealism, and the realists, who represented a more real-world and object-oriented sense of phenomenology, sometimes identified as ontological phenomenology. Conrad Martius was the leader of the circle of students at the time, and Husserl 
saw her realist phenomenology as a signifier for the dissenting side of the debate. Despite the complex historical circumstances of the split between Husserl and the real, realist phenomenologists, phenomenology continues to develop to this day, and many of the diverse developments still call out to be integrated. For our purposes, we hope to see something of the unity of real ontological, metaphysical, um, and universal ontology in the works of Conrad Martius and Husserl. In her 1957 book, Das Sein, Being, um, right here, Conrad Martius identifies a litany of things, of kinds of things, filling out her range of universal ontology. Not only material, formal, and categorical objects, real and ideal, concrete and abstract objects, pure entities, qualia, purely fictitious objects, but also purely conceptual objects. An abbreviated quote. We will take a closer look at the context of Conrad Martius's universal ontology after we highlight a few indications of Husserl's sense of universal ontology. In Husserl's 1906-1907 lectures translated by Claire Hill as Introduction to Logic and Theory of Knowledge, Husserl gives a similar litany, defining, uh, defining his own universal concept of ontology, which deals with being in general in the most universal universality, end quote. This is the, the bigger Conrad Martius. It's in this presentation. I'll give you the, you have the link if you're on the Zoom. Um, that's the German. Here's Husserl. There's Claire. And, um, and here's some stuff that he says. Um, being, in the broadest sense, in that of theory of science as formal ontology, is each and everything that can figure as the subject of a statement. Each and everything about which we, in truth, speak. Each and everything that can, in truth, be referred to as being. And this does not concern merely things, processes, and what is otherwise real, but even numbers, contradictions, propositions, concepts, theories, ethical or aesthetical ideas, in short, the multiform variety of ideal objects of those that cannot meaningfully be said to have a place in spatio-temporal reality, end quote, Edwin Husserl. In this work, and in many other places, Husserl goes on to distinguish not only formal ontology and material ontology, but also metaphysical ontology, a priori ontology, real ontology, the ontology of reality, and universal ontology. Some of these distinctions are well known. For instance, in, from the tradition of formal ontology that takes off from the logical investigations. But in some of these works, Husserl only intends to identify parts of the whole program of ontology in order to pursue, for instance, a general noetic eidetics, analytics, leaving the correlative noematic hyletics in the dark. <laughs> Forgive me. The full circle of noetic and noematic or hyletic disciplines and their, and their general theory appears only infrequently, often in the context of an a priori ontology and universal ontology. There are many other places where Husserl discusses universal ontology, its connection to real ontology, and its connection to metaphysics as well. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'm going to go quicker now and, and finish up. Um, right, we're, I think we're, we're pushing it, right? Um, in Logic and General Theory of Science, also translated by Claire Hill, in section 63, the ontology of spiritual being as an a priori science of spirit and consciousness, Husserl describes an ontology of spiritual being. This is an ontology of the spiritual layer of spirit, ensouled matter, the flow of consciousness, and so forth, which is a realm of nuclear meaning forms, forming an a priori network. And Conrad Martius attended these lectures. Earlier in that text, the realm of meaning is described as having an inner structure displaying the amazingly regular pattern of an implemented mathematical theory of forms, resting on, quote, four basic kinds of form nuclei, forming fixed configurations into concrete meanings such that all meaning is bound to, crystal, to fixed crystal configurations and only so crystallized can have concrete being. In Husserl's phenomenology, this is the crystallization of the sediment layer that forms beneath the hyletic flux of consciousness. The formal ontological moment of eidetic analyses in their noematic, I'm sorry, <laughs> careful there, in their noetic purity um, form these crystals, in a fixed, coherent crystal system. We should bear in mind this formal ontological framework, resting on four basic kinds of form nuclei, when we look at the universal ontological crystal system of Conrad Martius's framework, and also the four simplified expressions of the primitive equations in Spencer Brown's calculus, condense, confirm, cancel, compensate. The four forms of reference here indicated are Spencer Brown's fifth canon, called 
expansion of reference in chapter 3 of Laws of Form, and identified in a lion's teeth with the Buddha Sakyamuni's doctrine of Pratitya Samutpada, quote, what I call expansion of reference, he called conditioned co-production. Husserl opens the third chapter of a later lecture series, translated in English as First Philosophy, um, by Sebastian Luft and Thane Naberhaus, Thane, 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 uh, by declaring the need for a phenomenological metaphysics, a metaphysics in a new sense, a sense di different from the sedimented received tradition that he is often engaged in criticizing. Phenomenologically reformed and reconstructed metaphysics achieves some interesting development in Husserliana 42, the Grenz Problema of Der Phenomenologie, um, not yet translated, in relation to Husserl's own sense of the prote hule and related noe noematic elements, ideal and real uh, primordial facticity and sensuality. This is clearly a fecund area for further research and development in metaphysics generally. In Husserl's sense of universal science, universal ontology, the theory of science as mathesis universalis, um, and so on. But for now, let us see what Conrad Martius might contribute to phenomenological metaphysics. Whereas Husserl initiates phenomenological activity through an act called the Transcendental Phenomenological Reduction, in which the phenomenologist actively suspends the positing of hypotheses, including the hypothesis of the world, the world thesis. In Conrad Martius's real ontological reduction, we are instructed to do the very opposite operation. The world thesis is positively enacted, operationalized. The world is posited as factually real, whether or not it factually exists. The real ontological reduction is the reverse of the transcendental reduction. In the real ontological reduction, everything is seen as rising forth from its transnatural rootedness in the pre-existing framework in which it participates. The real being of the world is hypothetically posited. The things shine forth in their real being and in their self-rootedness, regardless of whether they exist physically, are dreamed, imagined, or hallucinated. Pure ontic research, that is the ontologically essential exploration of the real world, necessitates this reduction. I think I'm, I'm <laughs> running out of time here. I've published a bunch about Conrad Martius, but, and I'll, I'll publish this one too. You'll see that. Okay, but um, what I really do want to point out is, um, and, and, and I, I know, I'm like skipping. Uh, the, so the gist is there's this, ontological dynamism at the root of her, her research, when, when she, what she discovers when she pushes um, the hypothesis of the world um, you know, all the way, is that it's all based on this, the founding ontological dynamism. In certain contexts, when she's talking about like recursivity, the, the self, what is the self itself versus like the being of things themselves, um, things that have its selfness or they, they like are contained, you know, um, they have like ontological closure. Um, there's a a word she uses, um, schnitte, uh, cut. So cut, um, but as well this dynamism. Okay, so, so the, the, I think the, the parallel between the Spencer Brown paradigm, as I call it, based on the idea of the first distinction, and the Conrad Martius slash like Husserl um, project of universal ontology, which is based on this ontological dynamism and, and these like metaphysical categories that it gives rise to, I think it's clear enough. Um, I lay it out, I think, clear, clearlier in my, in my um, uh, conclusion here, which I'm kind of skipping. But um, anyway, getting to the point, you know, these things, you've seen them before, right? Um, you can kind of see them as a, a sort of formal crystal system. If you start over here at number one, it's like level zero, right? The unmarked state. Maybe that's level one, right? And then here's the first distinction. That's... Um, number number two here, right? And then and then um, above and below that we have the the two famous laws, right? And then um, the four ways of reading them, which correspond to these condensation, cancellation, compensation, confirmation, right? I just put them all together on on one sheet of paper so you can kind of get an image of like how they're relating to each other in a symmetrical sort of way. You see, um, we've seen this sort of symmetry in the the Spencer Brown. Um, investigations, right? Um, since I'm out of time, I, I won't get all into this, but um, uh, let me know if you think um, I screwed up in, anywhere here. I, I did it real careful, like, but um, there are these, these various levels of eternity that he correlates with um, these mathematical levels, the way he describes them, 
Um, but you could think of them in different ways as well. So, so anyway, that, that's, that's something, you know, we could talk more about. But this is a, a diagram, um, maybe by the hand of Conrad Martius, but maybe by her, um, her student. Um, and we, in, in the, the archives of Conrad Martius' world, we've, we've talked a lot about this. In fact, you'll find YouTube videos of us discussing this sort of, this sort of thing. Um, so this is a really cool diagram, okay? Right? And it's, it's based on the ontological dynamism, but you see it leads to these four corners, the prote hule, or or materialis, right? And then over opposite that, the or etherishes, ether, right? The primordial ether, the, the primordial spirit, and the primordial soul. These are the four categories out here. And then they interrelate to get to, finally, the human um, in this real ontological, universal ontological schema. So this is kind of some translations of of what these are and where these come from. So anyway, I'm just trying to like load you up with these um, things that you can you can see the immediate connections. Um, and there's these like weird relations between the things. It's super weird, right? It's kind of like um, uh, Raymond Lula, like Kabbalah stuff going on here. Maybe Tree of Samkhya um, <laughs> situation. Um, trying to figure out what what these are, how these things are related to each other. <coughs> Maybe it's like this, you know, where um, the infinite sphere, when it, when it gets moving. Anyway. Okay. Um, and that's it. Thank you. So, um, so, so maybe I can have just a, a couple minutes. Just a couple. Oh, here, let me... Okay, real quick, Lou. Okay, uh, I just want to make one comment in support of your ontology. Oh, I'll read it. A first distinction can neither contain nor be contained in any other distinctions. Thus, the contents of its sides <laughs> must be empty. If two distinctions are said to be equal, if their contents of their sides are identical, then there can be only one first distinction. The first distinction is a crystallization of possible forms. Sick, yeah. That was my point all along, is that there's only one the first distinction, you know, because, I mean, it's, it's just a convention. We're like, wow, look at all these distinctions, right? But really, they're, they're mutually interdependent indications of what? Because you start going into them, you start, oh, there's a distinction, you go after it. It's elusive, you know, because <laughs> where is that distinction? Where is the ultimate distinction? It is the seer, right? It's, but it's the, so my point is, it's the center that is everywhere of the infinite sphere famous saying from the Book of the 24 Philosophers, the pseudo-hermetic text. Um, anyway, that's where, that's where I'm bringing it to, you know, in the form of what I'm calling a universal ontology, since I find Conrad Martius' thing so, um, so well-developed, you know. And it's called Elsewhere God, right? Yeah, yeah, this is total theosophy, mystical stuff, yeah. And on the other side, when inside and yes outside thomas yes equal. thomas wants the opposite the as well yes <laughs> yeah it doesn't do anything at yeah. all <laughs> um I'm we, we can uh, the, I, think maybe maybe I just wanted to ask something about more, side but it's like i can do that later yeah maybe more yeah. internet people want to want to yeah. say something leon has the word. yes uh, yeah. i'd like to say something yeah. leon, leon, uh, oh first wait wait uh first leon real quick Oh, there you are. Hi. Now I can see Sorry, you. Randy. Uh, is your idea of the infinite sphere an absence of form or a presence of form, neither or both? Is the first distinction form? I mean, in a way, like, there's um, a presence of it, so... It is your infinite sphere. Okay, question noted. Um, we'll have a, 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 a bigger conversation about that. All right. Uh, any more um, voicing of questions? Because I don't know how much time yeah. we really have for dialogue. I think that question was identical to whether uh -huh. the, the distinction is about the inside, the outside, or the okay. active crossing. Lyle, real quick? Yes. What I want to say is that I'm going to be presenting on Saturday the uh, complete ontology that you were looking for. Maybe so. Look, uh, um, <laughs> that's interesting. I know that... Um, uh, Conrad Martius was, in fact, the historical, like, you know, major figure um, inspiring um, Heim, which is really cool, and I love the way he develops it. 
Um, you know, it's interesting to see how the idea of the fourth dimension and fifth dimension and sixth dimension might be discussed in Conrad Martius's context versus Heim. So, I mean, they, they are painting slightly different. Uh, this is a super nerdy conversation. I mean, we'll, we'll have to hear more about Heim before we can really uh, get some handle on it. But uh, what I'm doing actually right now is I'm modifying my presentation to include screenshots from yours. So, <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, the idea of the four fundamental things turns out to be very fundamental. Sick. <laughs> All right, any, any more? Um, and, then, and then I think we'll, we'll take a little break, um, and, and we will incorporate Raspberry Pi. So.